So today, I wonder if you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 6. I'm really excited for this sermon because I have as much clue as you do about where we're going today. So I've got a lot of stuff written down on the piece of paper. And I'm going to, we're going to find our way through. It's going to be amazing. So Genesis chapter 6, we're going to read from verse 9 to 14 and then verse 22. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three, se- three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence. Because of them, I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark out of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. And then God goes on to give them specific details on what it should look like. In verse 22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. And then we jump to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 7, reading from verse 1. It says, The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Now, that's generally how we read the Bible. You know, we just keep going with the verses. After I finish this verse, I'll read the next verse and off I go. Except that there's a 75-year gap between make the ark and get in the ark. It's like, that's a lifetime. Right? Our lifetime. They lived a lot longer back then, but that would be a lifetime for us. That would be enough time to, you know, do everything that we would do in our considered life. Those were the gaps between when God spoke to Noah. So God spoke to Noah, and then for 75 years, he heard nothing. And then 75 years later, God speaks again to Noah. Let's go look at Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, from verse 1, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And everyone's like, I want to be Abraham, right? That's amazing. Right there, right? So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Now if you read on, what happens... So God spoke to him. He gets into the land of Canaan. While they're sitting there, there's a famine. They move to Egypt. God blesses him. He gets more land and sheep and goats and all the stuff that was considered possessions, and people, a little mini army, like we preached a few weeks ago when Abraham had this sort of like in-house militia that he used to go smash people. Abraham leaves Egypt eventually. He comes, and Lot and him have this dispute over the land. Lot goes to move and live near Sodom. And as Lot leaves him, God speaks to him again. The gap between when God spoke to Abraham, gave him the promise, and he left for Haran, and when God speaks to him again, as Lot leaves him, 75 years. It's a lifetime between the two spaces that God spoke to him. And I'd like to ask us this question this morning, friends, and look at this thing. What else does God have to do to prove to us that he loves us so that we can hold the line over the course of our life. How many times does He have to speak to us? How many times does He have to come into our world and sit there and hold our hand and baby us through every moment before we can say, I'm mature? Because for Noah, God spoke once, and it held him for 75 years. And so when this flood came, Noah was ready. And for Abraham, God spoke once, gave him a promise once. And Abraham went and he was successful and he was prosperous, not just for his own sake, but remember, he needed the little mini militia because when he came out, Lot got himself in trouble. And Abraham was going to be the father of many nations and he needed to have equity, capital, property, all that sort. If you're going to set up a nation, you couldn't do it with nothing in your hand. And so he was faithful during the 75 years But he never saw the blessing that God gave him during that time as him for him. It was part of this promise that was going to come to fulfillment sometime. But God spoke once and it carried him for 75 years. 
And friends, I see, a, I see a, a tricky trend in the church, and I see a tricky trend in my own, own life, where we preach stuff like, you know what? God wants to meet with you today. God wants to come and He wants to build you up and God wants to um, tell you He loves you and pull you close. And, and it's almost like we feel like in the church we've got to dangle a carrot so that people can keep following Jesus. And friends, this series in reach is about maturity. And if we are going to be the people that are able to go into all the world and do everything God has called us to, we can't be those who are waiting for someone to dangle a carrot and make it worthwhile for us to do it. Got intense quite quickly, right? Blame the sign you tap. <laughs> At what point, friends, is it just enough to be obedient? Some of us are, you ever heard the God's got an inheritance for you? Stay faithful, there's an inheritance. Stay faithful, there's an inheritance. Right. One day God's going to open the door. Well, Abraham had a promise, but it was 75 years. Noah was building something that no one had ever seen before to protect himself from a weather pattern that they'd never experienced. But it was, it was enough. God had spoken. The promise of provision. I mean, guys, look at the, look at the church. Hey, give to the church. So give all your money, give all your time, whatever. And the more you give, God will give back to you. It's sick. What is Jesus saying to each one? Friends, because one day when we stand before Christ, each of us stand alone. We don't get to stand next to our home group leader or our husband or our wife or our pastor or our whoever is the person. We stand alone and we give account for our lives. And I feel we would be remiss as an eldership team and as a leadership team in this church if we weren't honest about that with you and with ourselves. Friends, that each saint is able to stand. And God has spoken to me. I know what he's called me to. And I will be obedient to him. Even if he hasn't spelt out exactly what it looks like on the ground. Because what's interesting, Noah gets given a, a very detailed plan. Right, that he has to for 75 years. Abraham gets given an amorphous promise somewhere in the future. And so he's just got to kind of live his life hoping that one day he'll find it. And for some of us, we've been given very clear instruction by God. And others of us, there's maybe a floating promise somewhere in the future. We feel it. But either way, right, God, if God speaks once, it should be enough to be able to carry us into our future. I ask myself the question, what kept Noah and Abram going the whole time? Because it doesn't, Scripture doesn't say that God dialed in on Zoom every two weeks with Noah. Noah, just walk me around, hold your phone up so I can see. Now, I don't like that joint there. The way you did the wood there, that's not awesome. Like, we're going to have to redo that part. Oh, it's not enough space for the lions. And you can't put them next to the zebras because they're going to eat them. And Noah goes back. Sorry, guys, I know it was going to take 50 years, but now it's going to take 75 because we're going to redo the back of the boats. And the son's like, ugh. God spoke once. It wasn't the constant update. It's the same thing for Abram. I mean, Abram, both, and also both of them, if you think about this, Noah wasn't sitting where people were like, go Noah! Like they didn't have Noah's fan club, like standing there with banners and trumpets, waving him on while he was building the boat. People thought he was insane. For 75 years, you, my friend, are a fruitcake. What are you doing? You're wasting your life. Trying to lead his family well in that time. You ever feel like that? Trying to pick this line for God in, in the middle of a crazy world. And everything's coming and trying to take your family to the side as well. Putting pressure. Noah felt that, but he held his line for 75 years. Abram goes into the most pagan nation at that time. They're worshipping hippos and, you know, dogs and all sorts of stuff. And he goes into the middle of that nation and he holds on to the promise. God wasn't appearing to him every three days just to say, hey, just in case you're worried, I'm here, I got your back. I still love you. 
My promises are still true. What else does God have to do for us, friends? What else must He prove to us? I'm talking to myself here as well, guys. Because I want to be able to stand on the Word of God. We've been given God's Word, the Bible, right? I want to be able to stand on that. And if I never have another moment with God, like this intimate, precious, worshipful moment, like we had, if I never have another moment like that, I will hold the line till the day I die. Because His Word is enough. And His promises are true. And what He's done for me is enough. I want, to, I want to know that. I want to be able to stand. Ask myself this question. If an angel appeared to me and gave me an instruction, would it change how I live my life? Well, maybe I'm high on meds at the time. It could be nice, you know. But is it enough that God just speaks as He speaks through, through His Word to us? What is that future moment that we're waiting for? What is the future moment I'm waiting for where God is going to speak to me and everything will change then? When that happens, then I will do this. If he says this, then I will do that. But until such time as I'm going to do this. When is that moment? The writer to the Hebrew says, Today if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. Today. And God speaks to us all the time through the Bible. And he calls us higher the whole time. His word is always there for us. Friends, this crazy dream, it, it keeps me awake sometimes. Can you picture a church where each person knows Jesus, knows they are loved by him, is secure in their love. They know that he holds them in his hands. They know they don't have to prove to God a thing. But they also experience all of the equipping and enabling power of the Holy Spirit at their back every day as they walk out into their workplace. Each of us. How on earth do you stop a church like that? And you know the crazy thing is? That's how God sees His church. That's how He feels about us. So a couple of... I'd like to talk about faith. This is basically the whole point of today's sermon. What is faith? Not faith, faith, but like faith, you know. <laughs> Hebrews 11 says, from verse 1, Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And friends, this is one of the most key aspects for us as a Christian. Understanding this thing of faith as you walk out. Our, because Scripture often it juxtaposes three things. It talks about, when it comes to these things, it talks about faith, then it talks about living by works, and then living by sight. And if you live by sight, you know like you have this moment in worship. You're busy standing there, and Duff gets up, and he like prophesies over you, like, and he like reads your mail, and how did you know that? And, oh my word, God's speaking to me. And you respond. There's no faith in that. I trust you understand that. Because God spoke to you. Right? There's no faith. You're responding by it's sight. Like, how did he know? It must be God. Okay, God spoke. I must do this. That's not faith. And then there's works, which we'll get to in a moment, where I'm going to prove to God now. I'm going to, I'm going to do this stuff because I want to try and earn enough credits, you know, so that when I go to God, I can cash in. You know, like those stupid, when you go to the arcades and you try to get the tickets, and if you get enough tickets, you get a prize. Some of us feel like that, guys, honestly. I'm going to go through my life, and I'm going to do enough good stuff, and when I get enough tickets, I can go to the stall, and I can get, what size teddy can I get? And it's never the big pink one. It's always that little, you're like, how many tickets do you need for that thing? You have to, like, live there for a week. Some of us feel like that. We get into this thing of works. But, friends, both of those are incredibly unhelpful. Living by sight, living by works. We live by faith. James chapter 2, James writes, he says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, claims to have faith, but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed. Thanks. But does nothing about their physical need. What good is it? 
In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God, and call that faith. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So I've got three quick things, and then I'm going to put this down. Cool, three quick things. But there's something about this grace-only message that's preached in the world today that, is, that creates an insular, belly-button, navel-gazing people. It's this. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what your life looks like. God will forgive you. God will save you. Everything will be fine. And so what we do is our lives go this way, and we begin to live an inward life. It's all about me. God can forgive me. God can give me a hope in the future. God can give me inheritance. God can give me provision. God can give me a marriage partner. God can give me, God can give me. And somehow we, bought, we can bind to this thing that that's why Jesus came. To make it better. But it's... I often think about it like this. As Christians... Um, I don't know, I don't, I'm not big on trucking. I don't know much about trucks. Um, but what I do know is the front, the front part, which I think is called a horse, right? Is that right? Yes. Okay, great. That thing there travels a lot better when there's a trailer on the back because it's very strong, the horse. And if it drives around without the trailer on the back, it, there's way too much power in a very small chassis. And it can cause trouble for itself, for the driver, and for everybody else on the road. And friends, that's the essence of understanding, for me, this thing of faith and deeds. I'm talking about getting into works. But Christians are designed, right, to do good works for Christ. It's the load on the back. It just travels better. It travels in a straight line. But if we don't care and we aren't, there isn't the fruit of faith in our lives, that working itself out, that thing flips all over the road. And we end up with, we become these comet Christians, as I've spoken about before. You know, close to God for a while, everything's fine, and then I drift, I drift, oh, I need God, and then I come back again, and then oh, everything's fine, and then woo, and then woo, and then come back and I move away. But we've been designed that as we go out into the world, in our wake, the seeds of the gospel through the fruits of the Holy Spirit. It's meant to be left behind us. The result of our faith. It's not in front of us. Do you understand the difference between faith and work? Works is this. I'm going to put it in front of me and I'm going to do all these things so that when I go to God, I can say, I feel like I've got faith now. God, you owe me one. Did you check what I did for you? But faith is this. I'm living my life. God, what do you need from me? I know you love me. I know you're for me. I know that you've equipped me and I'm ready to go. And in the wake of that life is deeds that God has accomplished through us that bring life and hope and whatever to those around us. My faith will always give rise to the good work of the gospel, friends. My faith implies that God is at work. Therefore, so am I. My faith implies that inasmuch as God loves the world, so do I. You see, it's impossible to have faith because our faith isn't just in something, whatever. Our faith is in God and who He is. And if my faith is in who He is, right, then He is transforming to me into the image of His Son. And if He loves, for God so loved the world, then I, who, I love the world. If God wants to seek and save the lost, I want to seek and save the lost. If Jesus would go sit at the well and wait for a woman who was rejected by everyone, I can do the same. It's faith. And friends, unless we settle this, we do end up being those Christians who every three days we need, like literally, like God to appear in bodily form in our quiet time just to remind us that we're okay. In submission and sacrifice, we find our strength. It's why we read the Word. It's why we pray. 
When a child is a baby, a mother takes that child to itself and feeds her from her body. Like this. But when that person gets older, they learn to go to the kitchen to go get the food. It's a normal part of maturing and growing up. And friends, God has given us His Word. He's given us His presence. He's given us prayer. He's given us all these incredible things that we can go to Him and find all we need for life and godliness. You know, have you ever had that moment where you open your Bible? I'm just freewheeling now, whatever. You open your Bible and you look in the, look in the Word and God speaks to you. There's this nugget that just like, poof, hits you between the eyes. How long does that sustain you for? Ages. That's our manna, friends. That's our daily bread that God has put out for us. Where is our daily bread coming from? It's not about reading our Bible and praying and just... Yes, sir, I did all the things I was told to do. But I'm learning to come to Him now, no matter the circumstance, and find everything I need for life and godliness. The fire that's in that coal in my heart, the fire that loves Him and that's for Him, whose responsibility is it to ensure that that thing stays lit? Your home group leader? My pastor? The big, big questions, right? I hope it's not too antagonistic. But guys, if we're going to be able to stand, a people who are able to go and find what they need, not just for themselves, but for others as well as we go. Quickly, the second one. I mentioned a few weeks ago when David goes and he takes on Goliath. Goliath says to the children of Israel, you servants of Saul. And they all just agree, okay, we are. And then they throw all the authority away. David goes, no, no, hang on. I'm not a servant of Saul. Children of God. And it's a funny thing, this. If you imagine this stage is the boundaries of my life. You know, God growing my life, influence and maturity and all that sort of stuff. I feel like, so often for myself, I like standing just about here, sort of equidistant from all the edges. And I know this part really, really well. Out there, it's a little bit sketchy. That's for like, that's for people like Tim, (laughs) the mature Christians. They ride the boundary lines of faith in their lives with regards to relationships, provision, time, energy, resource. They go out and they put themselves on a limb. For me, I'm like, it's much nicer if we can just have a little bit of a buffer. Makes so much sense. But friends, if we're going to be those who are sustained, you know what keeps you strong in the journey? It's routing the boundary fences because this is where God is at work. This here. I wrote this thing down. It's a Tweetable tweet. A life that has no need or expectation of God should not be surprised if the norm is to feel distant from Him. It's real. If I have very little need of God in my life, because I don't ride the boundary fences, I stay so safe within my... If I'm happy here, I shouldn't expect to experience the presence of God. You know when the Holy Spirit was given to the church in the book of Acts? It wasn't so that they could feel good standing here. It wasn't. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power to be my witnesses out on the boundary fences where it's wild people, where people swear at you when you try to share the gospel at Ash. Like where you, you are doing your best to love people and you are appreciated sometimes and not appreciated other times. Where God's like, make a meal and you're like, I've got nothing in my cupboard. You know? Where it's like, send this message and I feel emotionally like a little bit of a train wreck and I don't feel like I've got what it takes but now we're riding the boundary fences of faith and out here we find Jesus at work because he's always committed to changing us from one degree of glory to the next friends always pushing it out growing us maturing us why for the sake of the king and the kingdom and the gospel being extended he's not happy just to put a little circle around you and go that's you 
There you go. There's your, that's you for the rest of your life. He's so committed to maturity in us. And the last one. Anyway, oh, so much stuff. Walking the boundary fences, people, provision, prayer, God's word, business opportunity. Friends, I still believe in a church that prays for healing and sees people supernaturally healed. It's not something from the 80s. Still believe that people can get saved in the street. I still believe the power of God setting drug addicts free in a home group when people pray for them. Still believe in being able to walk out and stand in a queue in the, in the shop and God gives you a prophetic word for someone and then you try to work out how to share it with them. I believe in the power of God at work through His church, friends. But it happens out here. If there's no expectation of God. And friends, like I'm just letting, I'm talking honestly. Same you, me, I'm not better than you guys at all. I'm, we're talking together as a family here. But we cannot sit safe in the center of just here and expect to experience the presence of God. If you look at God intervening in people's lives, and I'll land with this and maybe finish the sermon another time. But <laughs> I'm pumped. It's amazing. This picture, right? What was I talking about? <laughs> I think I'll find myself. Right, let's start here again. If I'm living just within this space, and this is all I expect God to do for me, like, what reason does God have to come? He's already walked this road a thousand times with me. When you see God intervene in people's lives in Scripture, go have a look. It's for two things. And for two things only. One, to rescue them when everything has gone sideways and broken. You're not even here anymore. There's like a hole here and you just fell down the hole. This is like a major mess. Or you lost the stage altogether. That's one. The other moment is when God comes and He calls us to promotion. He calls us to ministry. He calls us to an inheritance. But show me through Scripture where God keeps coming to people the whole time just to reassure them. Just keep going. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Like, He doesn't. He expects us to be able to come to Him and receive all we need for life and godliness. Friends, if we're going to be a church, I, I feel this. While we, Jesus wants His church back. He doesn't want people who are in love with their local churches. People who go, I love Centre Church so much. He wants people who love Him so much. He wants his church back. He wants people who come to him and spend time with him. Not people who are happy to go and nibble at what the pastor's saying and kind of break that meal up over the course of the week and hope it sustains them. He wants people who feel free to be able to come to him and speak. And as they speak to him, to receive directly from his hand. That as we speak to him, we hear him speak back. We, there's this communication in this language. So I'd love to pray for us as I crash land this sermon. It's a little bit different when we preach in reach, friends, because we're talking, these are big things now. This is talking inheritance. This is talking what God's called us to as his people. But this isn't works. This isn't us trying to prove this is us being with Him, receiving from Him, and then going. So I'd love to pray for us as a community today, just before I hand back to Lance, for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, very specifically, very. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, we receive power to be God's witnesses. If we don't have the power of God, what on earth are we doing? We're just trying hard. And as the power of the Holy Spirit comes, I believe today some of us are going to get set free. We're trying to work hard, trying to earn it. Some of us have got broken self-identity. God can't use me. I don't feel like I'm good enough. Whatever the thing is that you're dealing with, the Holy Spirit comes in power to equip you. I'm trusting over these next eight weeks. Some of us are going to be terrified of the prayers that we pray because as we begin to pray, we start to see God answer quickly. 
You start really thinking about the words that are coming out of our mouths because it's like, oh, my word. I don't want to break anything. Others of us have been trusting for provision. God blows our mind where he opens the floodgates of heaven for provision to come in. But he's watching us just like he did with Abram. I'm giving you this provision to do what? To set up a nation. To set up an inheritance for others. I feel like in the kingdom we get what we pay for. What do we trust in God for? Not pay for. What do we trust in God for? What's in your heart, friend? Thank you so much for joining us. You might be asking yourself the question, how can I take this further? Firstly, you can send us your contact details to cindy at centerchurch.co.za where we can include you in our online connect groups and you can receive our daily devotional. Secondly, you can hop on our website where you can access previous sermons and find out more about who we are at Centre Church. Thirdly, if you consider yourself as part of Centre Church, we want to thank you so much for your ongoing financial partnership. The banking details are on the website. Thank you so much for joining us and hope you have an amazing Sunday.